Good evening, I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutu. Welcome to Consider This. Now today on the show we have Dr. Ioni Jolly, who is an independent researcher and historian based in Darwin, Australia, as well as Vernon Adrian Among, a cultural activist. So they're here today to discuss the Eurasian community, which is very much part of the um, ethnic makeup of Malaysia, but often overlooked and somewhat invisible in the cultural discussion of the day, cultural and political discussion. So both of you, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, we... Doctor, can you do my first start? Yeah, I have a please, question. Go ahead. Yeah. Because your um, doctoral thesis is, is quite fascinating. So you wrote one um, on the on Sejarah Sarani, and it's actually the first PhD to be completed in this field. And I guess I'm, I'm curious to know um, why this is not an area that's been well researched or writ written on more about. Um, probably because there's not many people in the community and we're not very well known anymore. So there's been quite a number of masters and honours theses on it, but not a PhD mm. in history itself. Um, usually there are people within your own community, so the Chinese or the Indians and the Malays, they have a lot more historians writing about their communities, and we just, we just don't have that, right. because there aren't that many historians within our community. Okay. Right. And the, the question of visibility is kind of important, because in some ways, uh, the Malaysian story gets uh, narrated at all in terms of the larger ethnic communities, the Malays, the Chinese, uh, the Indians to mm. some extent in the peninsula, and of course the Karasan Dusuns, uh, the Dayaks of, uh, and Malays of Sarawak, for instance. Uh, Vernon, uh, you know, you understand, and you're a Malaysian, you understand the ethnic politics. I mean, how invisible are the Eurasians of Malaysia? Um, I think quite invisible because uh, we don't... Uh, we don't have a political party to front us to create the news, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, and our associations, we do have them, are mainly social and perhaps maybe not as outward looking as we could be. So the kinds of activities that the community does are a little bit, I think, insulating, perhaps, you know, and could be engaging with the larger Malaysian community at large. And this year we hope to be doing that because the uh, Eurasian associations in Penang, in KL, and in Malacca, uh, celebrate 100 years of being in Malaysia. Okay, so, so within the community itself, is that kind of consensus in the identity? I mean, there is, um, I, I'm just wondering whether there is a debate going on in terms of how to refer, I mean, there's Eurasian, there's Sarani, is there consensus in how to refer to, to the community itself? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, the community uh, basically says that if you have European ancestry, um, you are part of the Eurasian community. Um, for a long while, it was patrilineal ancestry that was looked at. And for a long while, the Asian side of the Eurasianness um, was perhaps maybe not discussed or not negotiated or not, not explored as much as could be. So that is where I have become involved with the community in trying to look at how we were identified. Well, what do you mean not uh, looked at? Fully. I mean, uh, so meaning that it was more important, your surname, if it had a um, Euro European, European surname, surname yeah. that would make you have a better standing within the Eurasian community. Well, it was recognized as more Eurasian if you had a Eurasian surname. And, and the Asian part was then sidelined? Uh, the Asian part was to a certain extent, yeah, in, uh, not given as much prominence, okay. you know, un unless we're looking at the food. <laughs> and then there's devil curry, which is really Asian, you know, and all the other, you know, itik tim and all that. It's not easy for us to know our Asian ancestry because... Which is correct as well, yeah. A lot of us have been a Eurasian for a very long time, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And the first Asian ancestor quite often got baptised into the church and their name was obscured, their ethnic origins were obscured. So unless you have access to those original records, you quite often can't find it. So my earliest ancestor in Singapore was born in 1814. I think she was Malay, she might have been Chinese, but she was born in Singapore. Her name is Innocentia McIntyre, and that sounds very Asian, doesn't it? So yes. she was baptised into the church, I have the original records, but they give no indication of what her original name was, or what her original ethnic background was. So there are people now who are actually looking for that, they're trying really hard to find that, whether it's through looking through original records, or DNA testing. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I know my grandfather's part Sri Lankan from DNA testing because we have a full Sri Lankan cousin. We haven't figured out how yet. I guess um, as, as society becomes more woke in terms of 
what white privilege meant mm -hmm. and how it had an impact on non-white people as we become more woke and conscious of how we should have a more just look at the world, then I think uh, people are waking up and going, yeah, let's, let's look at um, our other side of being Eurasian, the Asian ancestry. Right. right, so this is, a, but you're talking about a context in which maybe white society dominates, but in a Malayan context, in a Malaysian context, in context of, of the South, you know, the straight settlements, for instance, where, you know, many Eurasian communities were, um, what was the politics, and especially around uh, the exclusion of certain, I'm wondering if you could help us understand the hierarchies, as it were, of, you know, of identity within the Eurasian community. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and even the word Sarani, which is, I understand is quite contested. Ioni? Um, the Eurasian community, so there's hierarchies within the community. So, and this is going back more towards pre-independence days. Um, the people who were more European in outlook, in appearance, um, the way they spoke, the way they behaved, were usually seen as being a slightly higher status, especially if they were lighter and fairer. Um, but part of that is from the external factor, so how people saw us. We were lower than the Europeans and sort of in between the Europeans and the Asian communities. It was a very sort of fraught position to hold within the society. Right, and that also, of course, redoubles on, on the question of uh, migration, right? And mm. in particular, you know, your lineage, which goes to Australia, um, the white Australian policy. Um, could you tell us how that impacted Eurasians in their self-identity, in their choice of where they wanted to migrate to and so on? Okay, so immediately after the war, there was a lot of people in Malaysia and Singapore, not just Eurasians, across the board, who may not have wanted to remain here for an, um, any number of reasons. Um, initially, Australia had very restrictive policies under the White Australia policy, so more people went to England. So they had a, it could it be proving that you're anywhere up to 51% or more than 75% European to be allowed access. It was, a lot of it was based on your appearance, of course. And as it progressed into the 60s, the policy started to loosen, so more people started to migrate. Um, and when they got rid of the White Australia policy in 1973, obviously that really ceased to matter. But yeah, it, the pre-war population probably more closely identified with the notion of being British or living in a British society, an English speaking society, a Christian community. And when things started to change, perhaps they were looking for that in elsewhere. So whether that's Australia, England, Canada, Australia is probably just the closest place that right. they could access and the cheapest place in terms of shipping routes or airfares. Okay. Well, we're going to continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes, so make sure you stay tuned to consider this. Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me, Sharad Kutten and our guests today, Dr. Ioni Jolly, as well as Vernon Adrian Among talking about the um, Eurasian uh, community. So, Dr. Ioni, your thesis um, wrote about the post-World War II Eurasian exodus from Malaysia and Singapore to Australia. Now, I want to ask about the push factors and the pull factors. So what were some of the reasons, the rationale for leaving Malaysia and Singapore and the reasons you mentioned just before the break, Australia could possibly be the cheapest, the closest and the cheapest place. So uh, what, have, what, was, what did your research find? Um, Eurasia, uh, sorry, Malaysia and Singapore after the war were quite unstable. And so that's not just in terms of security, it was in terms of jobs, employment, housing, there was a lot of change. Um, my grandfather, for example, from the time he was 16 to the time he was 43, he was living basically in a state of conflict. So you had the emergency, you had confrontazi, you had people bombing trains, you had the war. So it, they were looking for somewhere that was more secure, that was safer, um, that they could sort of bank their children's future on. Mm -hmm. So they wanted in 
the English language environment was incredibly important. So that was at unit in workplaces and in the educational system. Um, my grandfather had just, he worked for a private Australian company in Malaysia called Humes and towards the end of the 60s he'd actually been instructed to learn Jawi and I think that was one of the breaking points for him. He'd had to learn Japanese during the war and now he's having to learn Jawi and it was being imposed and forced on him. He could speak Malay, that wasn't the issue, most of my family could speak Malay. It was the how extreme the language policy may get. Mm. Not how extreme it eventually got, but just how extreme it possibly could get. Um, the Christian environment, it was very, very important to our community. And in Australia, you have the option of complete freedom of religious expression, and you have the option of not expressing any religious beliefs at all, which <laughs> happened with a lot of our community. Where a lot of us who stayed are a lot more Catholic and Christian than the ones who left. Um, they also, a lot of people want, were looking for a different lifestyle. So you have a lot more space and openness. Um, you can have, so the environments that we had pre-war where people had houses and gardens and it was a, just a different way of living. We have that there. Right, so this was, we're talking about the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we have the Cold War and the, the, the international context of that is quite extraordinary. I want to draw Vernon back into the conversation. Uh, when, Many Malaysians have family overseas. I mean, there is a Malaysian diaspora, yes. right? And Australia counts as a uh, home of many former Malaysians. How important are these stories, Vernon, about why people left and, and the circumstances? Are, do they still play out today in Malaysia-based Eurasian society? Well, I think the stories are really important because it offers perspectives from different points of view. I mean, like a lot of the people who migrated uh, from our community uh, why did they leave? I mean, people, people who were left behind or people who didn't go uh, would like to, I think, would, would be enriched if they knew what were the reasons uh, uh, that made them leave, number one. Number two, what kind of experiences they had. Number three, uh, how did they feel about the homeland that they left? Mm -hmm. Those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues of, 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 of belonging, identity, are really important so that we can also in a sense, trace how we feel about our own selves, you know? Okay, Ione, the question of homeland, it's an interesting expression. Do Eurasians think of themselves as having a homeland, uh, considering the, the multiple trajectories in which constitutes the Eurasian community? You have Dutch ancestry, you have British, or white Anglo ancestry, you have a whole range of possible uh, points of origin. Is, a, is there something like a homeland for the Eurasians? <laughs> Malaysia and Singapore, that's our homeland. It's where our community was formed, it's where people feel they belong. I'm not, again, I'm speaking for my generation, my mother's generation, I'm not speaking for the pre-war generation. My mother left PJ 51 years ago, she immigrated in 68 to Australia, and she still refers to this as back home. She's like, oh, you know, back home, blah, 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 which confuses people in Australia because she's been there for 51 years and she left as a 10 year old. So the homeland is here. They talk about a new Eurasian homeland in Perth because so many people migrated <laughs> to Perth. But the reality is it's still Singapore and Malaysia. So did your research find that life was better for Eurasians after migrating to some place like Australia? Um, because you know you talked about some of the push factors, language, uh, policy, unstable political environment. So was life better? Was, is it, was the grass greener on the other side? Um, I think it depends on the individual. So I've got family and friends here who have amazing lives. I mean, I could only aspire to their lifestyle. Um, but then, as I say to people, if you have your health and you have a great job, Malaysia's brilliant. I think there are various issues that affect how one is happy or not happy when a question is asked. And uh, from my own observations of people in my community, uh, you know, like for instance, um, I went to Australia to study. And when I did leave for Australia, I think there was a glimmer of hope in my parents' eyes that perhaps I might be the entry point for the family to settle in Australia. But I came back and I stayed. And uh, a lot of people have asked me, do you regret? And I go, no, I came back because I felt I had a better chance with my um, Australian degree here in Malaysia, which proved to be correct, you know. So, so yeah. that sense of uh, where is your homeland, I guess, is where you decide this is 
where your, fu your, your future either is or where your past was really something else that you really cherish. I mean, the colonial world, and specifically the British colonial world, created communities that were hybrid. Mm -hmm. And so the experience of the straight settlements in this part of the world were replicated in Sri Lanka and Anglo-Indians in India and so on and so forth across, uh, you know, the British Empire. Is there any sense of commonality? I mean, do, are there links between Eurasian communities from different contexts? Um, there's a, a lot of common experiences. and. But they so it's sort of like the Anglo Indians in Malaysia, sorry, in Australia, are a separate community to the Eurasians, so they don't come together in that respect. But there's very much common experiences. It's the same reasons they left, the same reasons they came to Australia, um, exist for each community. So there is a commonality of that, and there was a lot, there was a lot of fear that pushed people. Okay, in just a couple of minutes, we'll come back and continue this conversation. So make sure you stay right here on Consider This. Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me, Sharad Kutin, and we have on the show Dr. Ayani Jolie as well as um, Vernon Adrian among. So let's talk about the Eurasian community moving forward. Adrian, this is for you. Uh, Vernon, this is for you. Uh, I want to talk about the future identity and the relevance of the Eurasian community. Where do you see this in a Malaysian context? Well, in a Malaysian context, I think we're quite... Uh, we, are, we sit in a position that I feel is uh, quite special and unique in that we are not a race. We kind of like transcend race because we're such a hybrid of so many races. Mm -hmm. And if you look at any particular Eurasian or Sarani as I, I would like to identify as, uh, as a Sarani, usually if I, if I trace my ancestry, I've got Malay, Chinese, Indian, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, French, uh, Thai, Burmese, etc., etc. So that kind of positioning uh, a Sarani as this multifarious race, racial group uh, positions us as perhaps maybe being bridges of understanding between the different races. Right. Yes. Can, you, can you name us a few famous Malaysian Eurasians? I mean, whether it's on their father's side or their mother's side. Well, there is Tansfri Rebecca Santa Maria. Yeah. She was the ex-Secretary uh, General of uh, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. Um, currently, she is now sits on the ASEAN Secretariat in Singapore, uh, highly positioned in government and policy. Uh, we have uh, Ning Baizura's mother is a Sarani lady. Um, there, is, there is Alvira Arul, you know, who is the singer, and Russell Curtis, who are Eurasians. Um, who else is there? Uh, lots. Uh, Elaine Daly. Do Eurasians find that because of their surname, they're often told that they're not Malaysian or you, they, you don't have a Malaysian surname sounding surname? You ever get that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, now the thing is, I look Malay, okay? Until I mention my name, then they look at me and go, are you Filipino or are you Sarawakian? You know, not sure of uh, uh, what I might be because of the way I look and because of the sound of my name. But my name isn't very European either. So I get away with, uh, being recognized as either Sarawakian or Sabahan. Right. And I'm not, I'm Penang Sarani. Okay. And both my mother and father are Penang Sarani. And when you have to fill in those, you know, forms that require you to check your race on, on, on the form, what do you put? Because, you know, you've got all the races. You, do you check Dunline Line? Yes, others? I do check Dunline Line. I do you want to see a Sarani uh, checkbox oh. there? Well, you know, I think uh, if I... If I expect to see a Sarani checkbox there, then I expect to see Dayak, Kadazan, and it goes oh, on and on and on and on. Uh, to be honest, I think the boxes are, in this day and age, irrelevant and should be done away with. I only, you, know, you live in an Australian context now. You said in the past there was a white Australia policy in which you know, um, incoming Eurasians kind of figured a position themselves. Today, Australia is seen as a kind of uber multicultural society. We have Penny Wong, you know, yeah. Malaysian ancestry ri rising up the ranks, so on and so forth. Um, 
Is being Eurasian important in the Australian context? And if not, why? Um, to me, it is. Um, but I was brought up in a Eurasian household and a, a Eurasian extended family without actually using the term Eurasian. So it was when I came to Malaysia that I really started hearing the term. So it was important to me to understand my heritage and culture. To a lot of people in our community, it's uh, enough to know that they're Malaysian or Singaporean. So it's seen maybe as something different. So a lot of people in Australia, because we don't have the same restrictions and same classifications as you do here. So a lot of people see themselves as being Australian and, you know, my mum's from Singapore or that sort of thing. So it's slightly different in Australia. So going back to Australia, having done this thesis, what is it that you're hoping to contribute to the community in terms of this cultural conversation? What would you like the future of the Eurasian community there to be talking about? I just want them to know the sacrifices and the decisions that our ancestors or our grandparents and parents made um, coming to Malaysia or coming to Australia and I want them to know what it is like and what it was like in Malaysia and Singapore to sort of form a stronger attachment um, but it's purely to get a conversation starting because a lot of us don't have much awareness of our community or our heritage in Australia. Well, I know you're big on conversations and, uh, <laughs> and conversation, um, you know, and the new Malaysia is, uh, is ripe for uh, new conversations. Yes. Where do you want this particular one to be placed? I is it around the whole, we need to galvanize ourselves as, you know, as a community in order to push our rights, uh, you know, or is it something else that you would like to see? Okay, happen? great question. Uh, the conversation that I want to, start to start, or wanted, want to start with this Sarani issue, this Eurasian issue, is the idea that actually most Malaysians, most Malaysians are more than just Malay, Chinese, Indian, others. You know, in every community, we are very mixed up. And it's not just down to these four categories. There are Javanese, there are Achenese, there are Sumatrans, um, there are Hakkas, there are Hokkien's, there are Cantonese, there are Tamils, there are Salonese, there are um, you know, uh, Gujaratis, etc. And this is what makes Malaysia such a wonderful country because of the multiplicity of, if you want to call it races or ethnicities or identities. And the more we kind of recognize each other as being so different, then maybe we might be able to get along better with each other you know, and really appreciate the diversity rather than, you know, close up ourselves and become navel-gazing. Yeah, and it's so, I mean, we're so polarized according to race here. Correct, So trying yeah. to break down those walls yeah. is a difficult conversation, perhaps one that many Malaysians don't know how to have yet. To and I'm trying to have it with my own community by coming up with the Sarani issue, right. you know, because I have a lot of people within the Eurasian community who are saying to me, why do you want to use the word Sarani? That's a Malay word. It's not our mother tongue. And I turn to them and I say, what do you think our ancestors spoke before the British came? Just before the British came, what do you think we spoke? Because the love letters between Francis Light, the British guy who is said to have founded Penang, right, to his Sarani well, wife, right, Martina Rosels, was in Jawi Melayu. So Martina Rosels probably didn't speak any English, you know. And so there is this interesting idea of like, uh, uh, communities that kind of like floated between languages and cultures and that's 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 what I want to bring up in terms of the Sarani story. And you know, finally Ioni, uh, the, the, the story of Australia is a fascinating one, perhaps it requires an entirely new show, but that shift, is it complete? I mean the idea that Australia is a multicultural society and everybody in some ways is equal. You have one minute. <laughs> um, I think the shift has really been complete. When I was small you know, we went to the Asian food store, the one store that sold Asian food. Now you can go to the local Coles near our house and buy ikan bilis and ketchup manis. At least in terms of Darwin, that shift is complete. There might still be pockets in southern Australia where they still need a little bit of work, but Darwin, the shift is... This is Darwin's Asian. <laughs> Darwin's Asian, yeah. <laughs> Darwin's just southern Asia, you know? <laughs> Right. Yeah, unfortunately. Asia. Okay. <laughs> That's all the time we have. Thank you so much, guys, for being on the show. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Melissa Idris with me, Sharad Kut, and we are signing off for this episode of Consider This, and we will catch you soon on the next one. See you then. Mm -hmm.